الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The battle of Uhud is officially over The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم instructed his companions to bury the dead the martyrs at the side of Allah عز وجل At first the companions took their dead ones to bury them in Medina. And while they were in the middle of the way, the Prophet sent uh, his messenger to call them back to be buried in Uhud. And this is the Sunnah, where whenever a person dies, he is to be buried where he dies, especially in the battlefield. And among those who were buried was Abdullah ibn Haram. The father of the famous companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Jabir ibn Abdullah. He was buried along with his brother-in-law, Amr ibn Jamuh. And subhanAllah, and this is a miracle and a sign from Allah Azza wa Jal. Usually, usually the trend is whoever dies after a year, earth dissolves their bodies and it's all gone. This is nature. Jabir ibn Abdullah tells us that after approximately 30 years of the Battle of Uhud, or 36 years, there came a flood that revealed some of the graves in Uhud. So Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, who was the, khal the, the Khalifa, the Caliph at the time, sent to them that redirect and, and, and relocate the graves of your loved ones who were buried in Uhud. So Jabir went, he dug out his father and his uncle who was married to his aunt. And when he dug them out, they were as if they died yesterday. Nothing the, has changed. The body them. is still the same. Everything the was still the same to the extent that he says that my father had his hand over one of his wounds. And when I removed his hand, it was, you know, still moving. Yeah. It's not stiff like a dead man. And it started bleeding again. This is unbelievable. But this is what took place and happened. And this is a sign from Allah. Now, this is not the norm with all who die in a, a battlefield, in, in, in jihad. But this was a sign from Allah and a karama, something to honor these people yeah. with. And of course, it would bring comfort to Jabir ibn Abdullah. We were told that the Prophet ﷺ comforted Jabir and his aunt because his aunt was crying when they brought Jabir. And the Prophet ﷺ told uh, 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 his aunt, cry or don't cry. It's up to you. He was given the shade with the wings of the angels till he was resurrected. That is his soul. So don't be afraid. This man is in paradise. And he also comforted uh, uh, Jabir by saying, Jabir, your father, Allah Azza wa Jal, brought him and asked him, O oh, my servant, wish. Wish whatever you want to wish. Make a wish. So Abdullah ibn Haram, what was his wish, you think? What do you think he wished? Money? To come back to the yes. earth. Yeah. He wished, oh Allah, I wish to come back and fight at your side so can, I can die again and again and again. Allah Azza wa said, well, I've already ordained this, preordained this before that no one dies and come ba comes back to life. Sheikh, are we allowed to cry upon our uh, dead brothers? Well, crying 
is a natural thing. This was done by the Prophet ﷺ when one of his grandsons died and he had him, he held him in his, in his arms and he started crying. And also when his son, Abraham, who had less than two years old, he was less than two years old, his mother was Maria, the Coptic, that was yeah. given to the Prophet ﷺ by the Mokokas of Egypt. When he also died, the Prophet ﷺ cried. And one of the companions objected by saying, Prophet of Allah Wasallam, you cry? The Prophet says وسلم, that this is the mercy of Allah. And whoever Allah takes the mercy from his heart is, is not a yeah. normal human being. So crying is allowed. What's not allowed is to shout and scream and to behave as if you are not uh, accepting the ruling of Allah. Some women would, tore, would, would tear their, their clothes or pull their hair or slam their faces or shout. All of this is a major, all of this is considered in Islam as a major sin. And a Muslim is not allowed to do this. Yes, Abdullah. Yeah, I was just going to comment on the same similar thing. There are groups which use the Islamic label and they slash their faces and put blood on their faces when people die. Yeah, this is completely against Islam. Because whenever you want to label a group, you have to put this group to know if, if it's an Islamic group or un-Islamic. You, you have to put this group through the acid test. And our acid test is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So if anyone claims to be mourning the dead, one, the dead uh, uh, loved ones by slashing their faces or hitting their heads and backs with chains and swords and, and bleeding and considering this to be a form of worship to Allah Azza wa Jal, let's see the origin of this. Does it exist in the Qur'an and the Sunnah or the actions of the companions? If it does not, then definitely this is an innovation and a fabrication on Islam. It has nothing to do with our religion. Abdullah ibn Haram was a great companion of the Prophet ﷺ who died at the cause of Allah and wished to come back to fight at the side uh, uh, or in the, uh, for, the, for the sake of Allah. But Allah told him that this was already preordained that those who die do not come back to life and this brings us to another issue is Jesus Christ dead because if he's dead then Allah Azza wa preordained that the dead are not to be sent alive the answer would be no he's not dead we believe that Jesus Christ did not die peace be upon him and that he was resurrected alive to the heavens and he is awaiting the time where Allah Azza wa Jal would allow him to come and descend to earth. And he would not bring a new message. He would rule with the message and the laws of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Going on, after all of this took place, now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions are in their wounds. Yet, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them, to stand behind him, face the Qibla, and start supplicating. So the Prophet ﷺ stood in front of them and he started supplicating. And the things that he said are so strong in Arabic, I might find difficulty in translating it into English, but I may give it a try. He started by praising Allah and saying, Oh Allah, all praise is due to you. You Allah, no one can give what you withhold. And no one can withhold what you give. And no one can guide whom you set astray. And no one can set astray whom you guide. No one can bring close what you put far and no one can put far what you brought close oh Allah grant us your blessing your forgiveness 
your mercy and your provision. O oh Allah, I ask you to give us the enjoyment on the hereafter that does not turn away from us and does not change. O oh Allah, I seek the enjoyment on the day of poverty and that is the day of judgment where when everybody is poor, nobody owns anything. Who can dare and say, I'm a rich man, I'm a powerful man. Allah Azza wa Jal holds everybody in front and says, I am the king, I am the owner. Who has the final word? Allah. Who has the kingdom behind, uh, uh, under his uh, uh, possession and power? And no one dares to answer. To answer. Because it's only Allah on the day, day of judgment. So he's asking Allah Azza wa Jal for the enjoyment on the day of poverty. He's, and he says, Oh Allah, I ask you the security on the day that people fear. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the evil of the things that you've blessed us with. And I also seek refuge in you from the things that you've prevented us from having. O oh Allah, beautify faith and belief in our hearts and make us love it. And make us also hate blasphemy and make us hate sins and disobedience. O oh Allah, make us among the sane and the wise. O oh Allah, let us live Muslims and submitting our will to your will and also let us die as Muslims submitting our will to your will and make us catch up with the righteous on the day of judgment without being ashamed and without being tested. O oh Allah, have your wrath and anger over the disbelievers who disbelieve your messengers and who reject people from your path and way and have your wrath and punishment on the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, who also fight Against the justice Islam. and fight Islam. Beautiful wounds. supplication in their wounds, nothing but supplicating to the Almighty. I believe we have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we will be right back. <laughs> According to the Qur'an, we live in a universe that worships Allah. It is not just human beings who celebrate His praises, but animals as well. Join us every Wednesday at 20 GMT for your show, Even Animals Glorify. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam buried the dead, supplicated with his companions in a clear evidence and a manifestation of worshipping only one Allah and in accepting whatever Allah azza wa jal has decreed upon the Muslims. No questions, no rejection, no objections to what Allah Azza wa has decreed on them. They went with the wounded to Medina. And as soon as the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, and this was Saturday, it's one day event, he thought that there is a possibility that the polytheist would come back and attack Medina because going to Mecca it's about three days ride so maybe they had second thoughts and we didn't do anything let's go back and finish what we've started and that is why the Prophet told his companions 
whomever was with us yesterday in, in, in Uhud must come and go with us to Hamra al-Asad in order to fight the mushriks. Sheikh, did any one of the companions complain about uh, too much fighting, battle after battle? Did one, one of them complain? No, not, not even one of them complained because again, this was their objective. What is their objective? Is to support Islam, to support the Prophet ﷺ, and to get the honor of dying at the cause of Allah. So it was excellent for them. This is their bread and butter. Now, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged them to go to Hamra al-Asad. And as we can see uh, uh, on the screen, Hamra al-Asad is about eight miles away from Medina. It's not that far. But again, it's outside of Medina. So the instructions were clear. Only those who fought with us in Uhud were to come out with their wounds. And no one else. And this was also to show the polytheists the strength of the Muslims, even when they're down and wounded. What's the wisdom from to take only the, the people who fought before? Because he wanted those who were with him to be stronger. And when you see those who you attacked yesterday still standing in front of you today, yeah. this means that you, you are actually seeking to die at the side of Allah with your wounds. So they all went as the Prophet ﷺ called them to go out. Now, exactly as the Prophet ﷺ thought, in the middle of the way, Abu Sufyan stood and said to the people, what have you done? You've done nothing. Muhammad is alive, Abu Bakr is alive, Umar is alive, and all what you've done were, were 70 casualties. It's nothing. Let's go back and finish what we came to do in the first place. Safwan ibn Umayyah, though his father was killed in the Battle of Badr, but he was a smart man. He said, people, now we've barely escaped. And come on, who, who are, we, are we fooling? We know what, what took place. So if we go back there, they are going to come with fresh people. People who are eager to fight. And then something bad is going to happen and we don't want this. The majority were with Abu Sufyan. And they all said, no, we're going to finish what we started. Stop. Now, the Prophet ﷺ reached Hamra al-Asad, and he was met by a man called Ma'bad ibn Abi Ma'bad al-Khuzai. And he was from a, a, a tribe that had good relations with the Prophet ﷺ. So, a Muslim? No, he was not a Muslim. So, the Prophet ﷺ met this man, and this man was an ally of the Muslims. So he gave his sympathies to the Prophet ﷺ and he felt sorry to what happened to his companions and to his uncle especially. So the Prophet, using his wit وسلم, told him, if you see the disbelievers, try to turn them back and away from us. And this is war. So uh, Ma'bad went and on the way he met Abu Sufyan and those who were uh, with him, the, the, the enemy army. And they trusted him. So they said, Ma'bad, where did you come from? He told them, I came from Medina. And I came from a very, very strong army of fresh fighters who were so eager to kill you, I could see it from their eyes. And they came in huge numbers. All those who did not come to fight in, in the Battle of Uhud came out now. And the minute they heard this, they felt afraid. Because themselves, the Polish army, were wounded. And they were tired and exhausted of what took place. So when they heard this, they felt afraid and they decided to go right. to Mecca. But also Abu Sufyan used a similar trick 
So he sent one of his, uh, a group of his allies who were neutral, like Mabad, and he told them that go to Medina and I will give you so and so. He made a bounty for them and told them that all what you have to do is go to the Prophet and his army and tell them that we've met a huge army of the disbelievers and reinforcements coming from Mecca and they were all coming to Fight you. invade you. So he tried to do the same. And this is what took place. They went and met the Prophet and told them that the people are gathering tribes of the Arabia and so much power and they're coming to invade you. And what was the answer of the Muslims? It was in the Quran where Allah Azza wa praises the action of the Muslims where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the people when the people came to them told them fear those who are coming to fight you because they are in great numbers this Allah Azza wa tells us did not add anything to their hearts except more faith and belief in Allah Azza wa they increased the faith in their yes, hearts yes it did not decrease it or made them feel afraid yeah. on the contrary it filled it with faith and they said hasbunallah wa ni'm al wakil then allah azza wa jal is our supporter and we have our full trust in him and this increased in their level of iman and in the reward of allah the almighty and nothing happened bad to them the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stayed in hamra al asad for few days and of course they failed to come and meet the Prophet ﷺ because they themselves went were back. afraid and went back to Mecca. On that particular year, the third year of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ gave his daughter Umm Kalthum to his great companion Uthman Ibn, Ibn Affan. We know that Uthman was married before to Ruqayya the daughter of the Prophet والسلام, who died just at the time of the battle of Badr. And the following year, the Prophet وسلم, immediately gave his second daughter to Uthman ibn Affan, which indicates that the love and, 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 and belief in Uthman where the Prophet وسلم, does this to him. And that is why Uthman is known to be the Nurain, the one with the two lights because he married two the of the Prophet's daughters, the daughters. daughters. And this shows to us that Uthman's status is far better than Ali ibn Abi Talib's status yeah. because Ali had only one. one daughter of the Prophet while Uthman had two daughters. And also Umm Kalthum died at the lifetime of Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him. And the Prophet said that if I had a third daughter, I would have given it to Ibn Affan to show that the trust and love he had for Uthman Ibn Affan. Also in this year, the Prophet ﷺ married the daughter of his best friend, Umar Ibn Khattab. And Umar Ibn Khattab had a daughter by the name of Hafsa. And Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, uh, was married before but her husband happened to die and, his, and her husband was Khunais ibn Hudhafa he was injured on the battle of Badr and he died so the Prophet ﷺ married her and her marriage story is, is quite strange because when her husband died she was left she, she was widowed so Umar ibn Khattab her father went to his best friends. He went to Uthman ibn Affan. And he told him, Uthman, your wife died. That was Ruqayya. You're unmarried. You're a bachelor now. So how about marrying Hafsa, my daughter? And Uthman was still mourning his wife. So he said, um, I can't. I don't, want, I, I don't feel like marrying. So he wasn't very pleased with that. So he went to his second companion and friend. He went to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. 
and said, Abu Bakr, my, my daughter Hafsa has been widowed, and what about if you marry her? So Abu Bakr did not answer him and ignored him. And this felt even worse. And then, to his surprise, the Prophet ﷺ proposed to her. And of course, this was a great honor, and Umar immediately accepted, and she was uh, 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 wedded to the Prophet ﷺ. Only then, Abu Bakr came to Umar, his friend and companion, and apologizing, Umar, I hope that you didn't f find anything in your heart against me when I did not answer you. He said, yes, I did. He told him, the truth was that I heard the Prophet ﷺ mention Hafsa's name. So I knew that he was going to propose to her, and that is why I didn't accept. Otherwise, I would have definitely accepted her to be my wife. And the Prophet ﷺ married Hafsa bint Umar ibn al-Khattab, and she became the mother of the believers. I believe that this is all the time we have for today's program. So inshallah, until we meet next time, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.